let me start screen uh, sharing. And so let's make, I, I don't know how you've had these different talks before, but I would definitely say, let's just make this super informal. And um, I probably, I'm minimizing uh, you guys. So if there is a question, just interrupt me, just say something, uh, unmute yourself and just ask the question. Um, and uh, yeah, the talk, I, I don't think it'll take up the entire hour at all. So uh, we should have uh, more than ample time for like, you know, discussions, questions, things like that. Okay, so I'll pretty much uh, go into my career path. So I'll, I'll discuss how I got into the business I got into and what things I did. I'll talk about uh, policy and public service, what, what exactly that meant, because that's something I did prior to returning back to academia. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what bioethicists do. And I, I know sometimes biomedical researchers have a hard time understanding how some social science type of research works. So I'll go over a, um, um, one study that I did on uh, marketing uh, on uh, social media using YouTube around these unproven stem cell therapies. I'll mention what that is. So um, I'm really, you know, thank you, Rachel, for the invite and everything. I think this is a great opportunity to talk about different careers because at the end of the day, um, you know, I think all of you probably know this, the biomedical science environment is, you know, uh, at a state of hyper competition. And there's um, uh, quite a few studies that actually go into, uh, you know, what this hyper competition is. There's, you know, uh, 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 if you will, a glut of uh, uh PhD students, but also postdocs, longer postdocs, uh, fewer jobs, um, harder to get NIH funding, things like that, which um, people look at to think about, well, how can I use biomedical, my PhD or my, you know, postdoctoral training into other areas. So let's talk a little bit about my career. So um, I'm Canadian, so I was born in Toronto and um, I have an undergraduate uh, in a Bachelor of Science. Uh, with a specialty, uh, we can specialize uh, in your bachelor's um, we, in genetics at York University in Toronto. I then went into a, uh, and did my PhD. Uh, so, you know, I, I was mentioning this just um, uh, before we started. Um, I went to a master's program, reclassified into a PhD. And so I just came out with a PhD, no master's degree uh, in the Department of uh, Medical Biophysics. Um, and uh, I did this actually at Amgen Canada when it was still there and then uh, ended off in Sunnybrook Hospital and um, I worked in basically I did molecular angiogenesis but I was a pretty much a you know looked at a docking molecule downstream of a receptor tyrosine kinase pathway and so it was you know um, basically hardcore signaling. Um, I decided near the end of my PhD, I, I loved my PhD. I did a pretty decent PhD. I think I, I got maybe about nine, nine, ten papers out of uh, uh, my PhD, but I decided I don't want to run a lab. And literally prior to, it was in, in high school that I realized that I wanted to get a PhD in, in molecular biology and genetics. I thought it was the coolest thing and I wanted to run my own lab. So I, I knew I wanted this you know, PhD, but I also thought I would want an independent lab in academia uh, for like dozens of years before I decided near the end of my PhD, I just don't want to run a lab. Um, so, you know, I decided, okay, well, I, I, I kind of want to go into science policy, but I don't know how to really make that transition. And unlike this venue that you have, I really had to kind of struggle to figure out how this worked. I was thinking of doing these sort of policy internships um, there were these postdoctoral fellowships that could transition you into science policy. There was also um, these, um, um, you know, maybe just try to get a job in science policy. And potentially there was a lucrative career in Starbucks waiting for me if uh, all else failed. So I started with what I thought would be the easiest because I, you know, didn't, I, I just thought, you know, look, I did a pretty decent PhD. Why don't I just do some policy internships and I'll be great. I'll be able to do all kinds of science policy work. Well, that really didn't happen. Um, I started to do one internship at, and I'm not proud to say it, at a uh, conservative think tank called the American Enterprise Institute. This was only a two and a half month internship in DC. I wasn't super excited about that one, but it made me um, meet the, the um, director of the Genetics and Public Policy Center, which now is gone, unfortunately, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and that was also um, uh, in DC, not in Baltimore. 
And so that was pretty good because I spent uh, uh, another uh, semester uh, basically working as a policy intern at uh, the Genetics and Public Policy Center. Now, I realized right away that most science policies actually have an ethics foundation. May they be in the area of genetics, may they be in the area of biobanking, may they be in the area of science or medicine. And so I realized, hey, maybe I should get a little bit more experience in ethics and policy. I didn't really even realize that there was a an inter, you know, and an, uh, you know, a, a, a tight connection between the two. So. You know, I, I, after these internships, I thought, okay, well, you know, I must be decently qualified in policy. How hard can it be, right? Uh, wrong. I looked for jobs. I got some pretty decent interviews, but they all said the same thing. I actually don't really have real policy experience. And looking back, I would say, yes, they're right. But, you know, how do you get policy experience if no one gives you that chance? So that was, that was the conundrum that I was facing. So I thought, okay, well, I really did like graduate school, but you know, the idea of going back and doing another graduate degree after finishing a PhD was super not appealing to me. And I'm presuming that might be the same case for a lot of um, uh, graduate students also um, you know, finishing their doctorate. So I decided to do these, a, a postdoc, and these are not your typical science postdocs. There were a bunch of postdocs, both in the US and in Canada, that actually taught you how to be a bioethicist. They took people outside of bioethics and tried to make them bioethicists, okay? And this was called the Ethics of Health Research and Policy Fellowship. Uh, this was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and it was in, in Canada, it was between two places, Dalhousie University and the University of British Columbia. And so I decided uh, I would work with a supervisor in each area. Now, both Francoise and Michael, they were PhD science, uh, they were PhDs, but they were both philosophers. So this was the first time I never, I, I worked for someone that had a PhD outside of biomedical research or an MD that's, you know, super into biomedical research. So this was quite different. I've never, and, and I realized that there was, you know, a culture shift, uh, you know, they think differently, they do research differently, and it was both difficult and challenging, but also super interesting. I really l fell in love with bioethics. Now, after two, two and a bit years of doing uh, a fellowship, um, I got the policy background I needed, and I wanted to always work uh, for the federal government in Canada, okay? So this is our Canadian parliament. And I worked for Health Canada, which is uh, a regulator equivalent to the US FDA. And uh, they, so they oversee you know, uh, the safety and efficacy of drugs. I first worked in a policy shop called the Assistant Human, uh, Assisted Human Reproduction Implementation Office. In 2004, Canada um, decided to make a federal law governing all of IVF, in vitro fertilization, all those technologies, but also research to do with embryos. And, and at that time, embryonic stem cell research was you know, a major ethical issue. Um, cloning, you know, cloning human beings was a major uh, ethical issue. And so uh, I really wanted to work in that area. Uh, and so I actually got hired in the office that was developing regulations under this law. And I'll mention what that really means when I talk a little bit about policy. For after about two and a bit years, I decided, you know what, I'm tired of this uh, office. I, I wanted to go into a different area. Um, you know, at that time, uh, different provinces were challenging the, the, the constitutionality, if you will, of the law, of the federal law. And so by the time, you know, they iron things out, which in, you know, government, you know, time would be years. I decided I'm going to jump into another policy shop, and I went into the science policy director uh, directorate. And over there, I made um, an intramural policy for all health Canadian uh, health Canada scientists called the scientific integrity policy, which talked about things like responsible conduct of research, authorship, uh, publication practices, things like that. And I really enjoyed that. For several reasons, which I'll go into in a minute, I decided to leave government and go back into bio academia, but in bioethics. And so I worked for this guy right here, Tim Caulfield, right above me. Uh, he is a re world renowned uh, bioethicist. He's actually a lawyer. So this was the first time I worked for a lawyer as a supervisor. And, um, uh, and this was a research associate position for me, did that for two years. And then I got my faculty gig, which brought me pretty much permanently now into the US. Um, uh, at the Alden March Bioethics Institute at Albany Medical College 
in upstate Albany, New York. Okay, so there I, I got an assistant professor. I then made the transition to an associate professor. Uh, and just over three years ago, um, I made the move um, to Mayo Clinic. My, the position at Albany Med was more teaching than research. I've not really wanted to do that. I wanted to always do more bioethics research than teaching. Um, and so this was a, a great move for me. Mayo Clinic is uh, an awesome place to work, especially because um, they really love research and they love mingling it into clinical practice. So that was always very appealing. And so at Mayo Clinic, as Rachel mentioned, I work at the Biomedical Ethics Research Program, but I'm also affiliated with the Center for Regenerative Medicine and uh, am faculty over there as well. Okay, so what careers involve science? And I don't wanna call them alternate careers. I wanna basically say that, you know, the careers that I was looking at were, they, they use science, they utilize science, but, they don't necessarily involve, in my case, bench research, okay? So I don't really like the term alternate, although you know people use that uh, as well. So I think there's many ways you can choose your career path and there is no left, uh, there's no right way. And whatever I tell you about you know, my end goal and how I got there, you should take it all with a grain of salt because I think there's many ways uh, that one can get into bioethics research or get into any kind of policy position within the federal or potentially state governments, okay? But the one take home message I would say is that you really do need to complement your biomedical science skills. I think they, most places will look for something around that. And, you know, I tried to start doing that during my PhD as I took those internships during my PhD, uh, but in my case, it wasn't sufficient, uh, but perhaps it is now. And it really depends on the type of job that you get, uh, that you're looking for, things like that, okay? So how do you complement it? So, you know, I'm gonna date myself. I love Napoleon Dynamite when his uh, movie came out. You know, Napoleon wanted to, you know, acquire nunchuck skills and computer hacking skills, which he thought were important. Didn't really get him anywhere far. But one way I think you can do that is to complement your science, your strong science background in biomedical research with something like a public health master's, and, and I'm putting only master's level degrees. There are people that are ambitious and get another doctorate. It's actually becoming more commonplace to get you know, a professional doctorate and a PhD kind of thing. Um, a master's of public policy, master's in bioethics, a master's in public admin. And, and these are different types of things, okay? That a uh, public health master's is different than bioethics, it's different than public and MPP and is definitely different than an MPA. Um, so you should look up those things to, to understand better at you know, why, why people take these different types of degrees. Um, in my case, I did that postdoctoral fellowship. And again, I think, you know, I'm old fashioned enough to know that I really do believe that a PhD gives you a transferable set of skills of how to be super analytical. And to me, you can do that no matter what your job is at the end of the day. So I think you can also learn policy or anything else on the job. Okay, so um, let me just mention what is sort of policy, okay, so people have a, some kind of an understanding of it. So really, policies are meant to guide human behavior, okay? Um, you know, I, I can think of several examples. Let's say you want to uh, make sure everybody is safe and even minor car accidents, people wear seatbelts for, because even in a minor car accident, you could hurt yourself, uh, get a concussion, get, you know, all types of various injuries. So, you know, these, you can make a policy where, you know, in the, in the case of seatbelt, it, it's a law, it's a, um, I believe it, there are state-based laws um, that you have to wear a seatbelt or you get some kind of fine, okay? Um, so there's different types of policies. Sometimes uh, people use them interchangeably, but they, that's incorrect. Uh, there's guidelines, standards, codes, laws, regulations. Uh, these are all, if you will, things that are written down that tell you how to behave. Uh, but there are differences. So guidelines are non-mandatory. So for example, you know, um, Rachel mentioned that, you know, we both went to that International Society for Stem Cell Research Conference. They make guidelines on how to use um, embry embryonic stem cells. They make guidelines on how to translate uh, stem cell research into the clinic. Uh, but these are non-mandatory. So they use words like should, whereas laws and regulations, regulations are basically subordinate laws. So laws basically say, uh, you know, 
uh, we need to protect humans while driving. And uh, uh, regulation will say, well, that means everybody has to wear a seatbelt while driving. That may say things like uh, all cars now have to come with airbags, um, whatever. So regulations are the details of law. If you break a regulation, you break the law. If the law is under criminal sanctions, you could go to jail. You could uh, get a fine. Uh, but not all laws are, are criminally bound as well. And so they use words like shall and must. So I used to teach policy, and so I'm giving you a really crash course in about five minutes. Um, now, again, as I mentioned, one thing I realized is that most policies around science are all there based on some type of ethical principle, and much of it is around safety, right? So safety of human subjects in clinical research, safety of uh, you know, upholding um, patients' rights of um, uh, samples that they may bank for future use or uh, you know, making sure that you're using animals and sacrificing animals in an ethical way. These are, are all policies that are based on a foundation of, of, of ethics and principles. Um, and again, policies are just one way to influence human behavior. Uh, we do things like have a public health uh, campaign uh, where we're trying to educate uh, through public health service announcements about why it's important to take vaccinations. Uh, including uh, the, the new COVID-19 vaccines, right? So this may be uh, another way of trying to influence human behavior. Sometimes you may, you know, you may tax cigarettes. So you make an economic disincentive to smoke because if you make higher ta taxes for cigarettes, well, then maybe that will cause people to smoke less or maybe not smoke at all. So there are many ways to change human behavior. So what policy is, is basically there's a systematic way, just like in science, um, of how to develop a policy. First, you start at the top where you do, um, you know, what is the, the issue? So, you know, um, accidents are caused while driving and we need to protect humans. Um, and one way, you know, uh, small accidents, people can go right into the windshield. So someone said, well, you know, people can go right into the windshield. Well, you know, seatbelts can prevent that. And so the risk is going through the windshield and the way to prevent it is through a policy where we would say, we now mandatorily will make you wear a seatbelt. And this is done to mitigate the risk of going through a windshield and hurting yourself. So that's how we choose what is the best way to guide human behavior under, again, that ethical principle of, of human sa you know, safety. Once we make something, you know, when I was making regulations on in vitro fertilization and, and things, we consult stakeholders. So, you know, in this case, we consulted women that had babies that were born from IVF. Um, we consulted children uh, that were old enough uh, that were born from IVF. But we also consulted, uh, you know, and uh, reproductive endocrinologists, OBGYNs, pediatricians, things like that as well, who are going to be impacted by the type of regulations we made. We then present options, and I don't care generally where you work, you'll have some person that oversees things. It may be, uh, in, in the case of making those laws on assisted reproduction, it was the parliament, the Canadian parliament, that actually had a committee that would sign off at the end of the day. But of course, it had to go through our federal department and then you know, went off to parliamentary, you know, um, a, basically a committee there and uh, then apparently was actually approved by both you know houses so um, you know depending on what kind of policy you're making you have to present these options make a recommendation and then you have to you know implement the policy and then ideally you want to monitor the policy to actually see if it's working right it would be useless to make a seatbelt law if nobody wore seatbelts right and and you still had the risk so this is policy 101, if you will, and, and how um, policy works. So what is policy? Well, honestly, I was a senior policy advisor. I've been a senior policy analyst. I've been a, a senior regulatory analyst. Um, all of those words kind of sound similar, and they are, but they mean different things. Um, you can be in government, and you. I was a policy developer, so I literally wrote policies. Um, but you could run a program. Um, it could be, I don't know, a vaccine program for your state if you work for the State Department of Health in Connecticut. Um, you can, um, you know, maybe you're at the federal level and you need to brief, um, you know, all different health departments, NIH, FDA, EPA, 
and you work for the NIH and you want to brief them on some kind of a major policy issue that will impact them. So you're, you know, there to do only horizontal communication. You could be, uh, you know, it, it, honestly, it could be just about anything. You could work as a program officer for NIH and um, deal with a particular portfolio of grants and oversee NIH review committees, talk to the uh, researchers applying, uh, you know, talk to council members, all kinds of things. It depends on the type of job for obviously the, you know, the, the department or agency that you're working for, if it's, you know, at the public service, or it could be even a nonprofit. So let me talk a little bit about why I also left policy and, and, and sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages, okay? So um, there, are, there are a lot of advantages. And, 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 you know, take this again with a grain of salt. This is the norms that I saw in working in the Canadian government I don't, and the federal government. Um, I don't think they're going to be too different than in the U.S. or even state-based uh, um, government. But the benefits were, well, you work nine to five, okay? Other than being upper management, uh, pretty much nine to five was your your work. So if you're if you're interested in more work life balance, uh, which certainly as a PhD student you rarely get, um, this would this would be it. They have great pay uh, for the, you know the amount of work you do, great pension and, and benefits. Uh, they have um, they were generous in the vacations and time off. We called it the golden handcuffs because they kind of locked you in uh, into those those types of benefits. Okay. They value diversity of experience, less content expertise. So, you know, by the end of your PhD or especially as a postdoc, you're going to become a, a, a really specific expert in one area, uh, per, per, potentially in the world. And um, that's not going to be useful in government. They want you to be more diverse uh, and less of an expert. Um, this way, um, you know, you can do policy in any area of science. It doesn't have to be specifically one area of health, for example, okay? Um, if you wanted to go into upper management, the idea was that you moved around in various science-based departments to gain that diversity of experience prior to, you know, going up that food chain. Its advantage uh, is that you can learn a diversity of topics that way. So if you're interested in all areas of science and don't want to be, uh, you know, super hyper-specialized, well, this is a great way of doing it. There's lots of training opportunities. So, you know, in Canada, we're a bilingual country, uh, English and French. And while I learned French uh, in grade school, I pretty much forgot it and didn't go past grade nine. And so I loved learning, uh, well, this would have been my now third language. I didn't realize how much I loved learning French. Uh, but it gave me that opportunity. It also gave me the opportunity to take leadership courses, something we don't ever really do in academia before you're running your own lab. Um, and, and, you know, even go into different areas. Like I learned a little bit about survey research uh, while I was in government. Um, and honestly, when I was working for the federal department, it was great because I was, uh, I felt like you know, people were listening to me that, you know, what I'm doing did make a difference. It impacted the lives of, you know, people that were getting assisted reproductive technologies or the scientists or, uh, you know, the clinicians that were, you know, you know, giving assisted reproductive technologies to, to patients. So I really thought that what I did made an impact and that felt pretty good as well. But for me personally, and, the, and again, everyone's different, um, I actually, um, you know, uh, felt that there was less of an advantage compared to what I really liked. Um, you know, a lot of civil servants were very process driven, not product driven. And that kind of, you know, was annoying. Uh, a lot of people, you know, you, you get the impression of, you know, the DMV, the lazy DMV public servant that, you know, is just let, you know, making everyone fill out the dot, uh, and, 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 you know, dot your I's, cross your T's, or, you know, your application is, is, you know, null and void. This is kind of what I saw as well, even in policy shops. Um, government is bureaucratic. It's not democratic, okay, which means you have a manager and they have a manager and then they have a director and, and so on and so on. Uh, they can shelve your projects. You could lose your budget. In that sense, it's very much kind of like uh, working in industry. Um, and so, uh, again, if you're in bureaucratic organizations, if the leader is not really great uh, at doing their job, maybe they don't fully understand it, maybe they're just, you know, in it for themselves, um, that could get frustrating. 
Um, again, I loved generating knowledge as a researcher, which is what we do as researchers. I did not like brokering knowledge. And in policy, you're, you're using knowledge uh, to develop policy. Um, managers, so you know, for me, the next level would be uh, a director, a sen more senior level, and I had no desire to manage people. Uh, basically, you're dealing with all kinds of HR issues, uh, all kinds of other types of issues, and that was just not something I was personally interested in. Um, and, and I mentioned this again, you know, policy analysts are, con are not content experts. They're, you know, they have general analytical and, and, and other types of developmental type of skills. Um, so for me, I valued content expertise. Um, you have no ownership over intellectual property. So there was no such thing as authorship, really. <laughs> um, you know, I, I made that science policy, um, uh, science integrity policy for Health Canada. My name is not appearing anywhere in it. So you know, first of all, are there any questions? Because I know I'm rambling and I tend to talk pretty quickly. Are there any questions or should I, um, I'm pretty much gonna go over what is bioethics and give a short talk about um, bioethics research, but I want to see if there's any questions at least about policy and stuff before I delve into this area. Okay, um, I'll go on and save all the questions for the end. So what is bioethics? Well, bioethics is a branch of philosophy, okay? And I did it because I wanted to, I realized that ethics was, um, you know, a foundation for policy. And I used it as a, honestly, a stepping stone to get into public policy. So um, basically, um, ethics is a branch of philosophy. And um, it's really about, you know, right and wrong, good and bad. For all intents and purposes, bioethics is a, um, uh, if you will, a, Subdiscipline, not even. It's kind of different, uh, but it it also tries to understand what is right and wrong, or what is good and bad. But it it uses a a, a variety of different theories and practices, and a variety of different research methods compared to traditional uh, ethics, which is, again is 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 very philosophically and normatively based. So what gets captured in bioethics? Honestly, it's it's amazing. It's it's everything, right? So I've written papers and and done research on you know gene editing technologies and, and ethical and policy issues around that. Uh, a little bit around clinical practices. Um, nothing about neuroscience. Nothing about animal research. Uh, I used to do a little bit of work in the area of assisted human reproduction, and um, my specialty is regenerative medicine and research ethics. So that's uh, that. The, the right part and that you can get even hyper specialized just like you can um, in biomedical research uh, uh, the same can go into bioethics there's been a growth of bioethics um, uh, maybe not our current president uh, but in the, you know in Obama's administration Clinton's administration in Bush's administration uh, there were uh, presidential commissions of bioethics and as I mentioned, all research policies around biobanking, stem cell research, like the ISSCR um, uh, guidelines, research involving humans, animals, uh, even clinical practice, it's all based on some type of ethical foundation. And we can also do ethical consults. You could do consults in the clinic where um, people, I don't do this, um, but um, where there's like some type of disagreement between let's say what maybe a patient wants, what the family wants, the patient is waxing and waning out of capacity or they're out of capacity uh, compared to what let's say the clinical uh, team wants. And it's a, 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 you know, a, consult, a, consult, a consultant's uh, job to sort of you know, mitigate or alleviate the, these tensions. You could also do it in research ethics consults. Um, so they wanna know what's the best way of getting informed consent for this unique group of of uh, patients that we're trying to uh, talk about and see if they want to take COVID-19 vaccine, they'll do a research ethics consult with someone like me. So um, bioethics is an interdisciplinary or at least a multidisciplinary team. So as, as you saw when I talked about my, my past, I, I work for philosophers, lawyers. I work with pretty much every single person in this. And that is pretty exciting stuff for me because uh, I didn't realize how, you know, because I only, you know, grew up in biomedical research, I didn't realize how different all of these other areas were. And I, I, I have now just a much better appreciation for what these people do and what they bring to the table. Um, bioethics was also cool because, you know, we de dealt with all types of research methods. 
Um, we deal with what you know philosophers do, which are sort of, um, if you will, a conceptual or what they call a thought experiment. Um, we do quantitative surveys. I've published um, a couple of surveys. I do mostly qualitative research, uh, which involve interviews, content analyses, um, focus groups, things like that. What do we do? Well, we do pretty much the same thing in academic research as you would in biomedical science. We can teach, we can conduct research, we can publish, we give talks. Um, we, as I mentioned, can do research ethics or clinical ethics consultations. We sit on different committees. I sit on uh, two ISSCR committees. Um, I sit on obviously many internal committees at Mayo. Um, you know, I've sat on, um, you know, the stem cell oversight committee for the Canadian uh, federal government, um, things like that. Um, we can uh, work for private organizations as well, uh, or work with private organizations or government. I've worked with the Federation of State Medical Boards to make policy. Uh, so you can also do policy work as a bioethicist, but from an academic standpoint, as opposed to working in policy for a, uh, like a government institution or a policy group, okay? So there's many types of bioethics education. Uh, there are um, uh, a lot of fellowships that will train people like you uh, in uh, bioethics, and, and these are just a, a list of them. Uh, some of them may be defunct by now. There's way too much education to talk about uh, in a simple list. Um, there's uh, this website that lists all of it, but really, if you just Google, you know, graduate bioethics, uh, programs, uh, there, you will find lists of them and there are tons of them. I'd be happy to talk to anybody uh, after this uh, about any, anything specific if they're interested, of course. And then there's, you know, uh, specific job sites as well, uh, where you can, just like for other academic, uh, I didn't even put academic.edu, uh, but there, um, uh, there's many different sites, specifically even bioethics for various different types of research assistants and other type of positions. So um, at Mayo, we are um, we work for as the as the name says, biomedical ethics research program. So we are all empirical researchers. We do conceptual research as well, but we predominantly do empirical. Um, so we collect data um, and analyze data, um, and uh, we do have a, a a master's program. It's usually if you're doing some kind of a postdoctoral fellowship at Mayo, you can uh, do a master's in clinical translation with a bioethics concentration. And so that's the concentration right there. So let me just give you a quick example of the type of research I do. Uh, and this is just one example. I do, as I mentioned, I do interviews, I've done surveys, I've, um, uh, but one of the areas is called content analysis. And this is, um, uh, I did a content analysis of about, um, of how marketing occurs in, in um, an area of regenerative medicine. So you may have heard of this, I'm not sure, but basically there are, uh, about a thousand clinics in the U.S., but this is a worldwide phenomena where people are um, getting unproven, so they are scientifically pretty close to baseless um, therapy. So, you know, there may be a ton of awesome work done in the bench, at the bench. Maybe some of these are starting to, you know, do clinical trials, maybe phase one, two, or three even, uh, but very few stem cell therapies are, quote, proven to date, you know, short from, you know, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, bone marrow transplantation, stuff for the skin or, or eye. There's very little, quote, FDA approved stem cell therapies. And um, a lot of the people, we, we did a, a really nice study that got published last year in JAMA. Um, that was the, the Foo et al. paper there, where we even found that the people that are giving these stem cell therapies are actually unqualified to give them. So, and, and you can get a stem cell therapy for just about anything. And it's very heavily marketed directly to patients. And most of it is not only false and inaccurate, it's all pretty much done through the internet. So based on that, you know, um, people get their information um, from the internet nowadays, especially their health information. I'm very much interested in how people consider valid for, from invalid or credible versus incre uh, not credible information and how that impacts their health decision making. And I'm very much interested in the context of when people have sort of multiple chronic conditions have exhausted all medical options and are almost looking for something fringe 
or something unproven. So that's the sort of the niche specialty uh, of my focus. And stem cells, is, it provides a great um, area for that research. So, you know, I wanted to understand how specifically um, patients were discovering on YouTube um, these advertisements around stem cell therapies. And so we've been hearing more and more about them, but no one has done a systematic, uh, um, you know, there there's, wasn't very much done uh, on the role of social media in uh, advertising misinformation in this space. So of course I, I did, I did it for YouTube for several reasons right there. It says, you know, it's, it's, it's um, a lot of users. Um, YouTube also appe uh, appeals to an older generation. Uh, social media, face everyone uses Facebook, all age groups, but YouTube is uh, primarily used by an older uh, adult population. And so um, I decided to look at YouTube. And I also want to study narratives on YouTube. So, you know, a lot, there's, there's several studies that have shown that, you know, telling patients a narrative, a story, about their struggle, about how they got a, a, a unique therapy or something like that is much more powerful at influencing health behavior than giving fact-based information, okay? Also YouTube, because it's a video-based platform, it caters to a lower health literacy uh, group. So even if you make information at a grade five level, you know, people have a short attention span. They don't want to expend a lot of cognitive resources to read some patient booklet. It's a lot easier to go to YouTube and hear a patient's story because you're going to, you know, you're going to understand that patient. You're going to say, hey, I identify with that patient. They have the same problem. And look, that stem cell therapy helped them for their condition. Why can't it help me? So it makes it more believable and something that's more believable can influence how you actually behave. So this is one of the areas I'm, I'm most interested in. So um, we analyzed 159 videos of five major conditions, ALS, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and spinal cord injury based on a, a 2014 cell stem cell paper that I published. Um, we looked at a little bit of metadata, you know, how long were these videos, how many were the subscribers. We also found things that other people found. We found that in many cases, the patients, so these were all mostly patients talking to another patient. And they, very few of them discussed risks, very few of them mentioned cost, or said that the stem cell therapy was um, you know, experimental. We found out where people were coming from, where uh, they were traveling to. So we found a lot of Americans traveling to India, but then followed by America, uh, Mexico or, or Panama or China. We found some pretty interesting things. A lot of them acted out scenes. Um, not much super strenuous emotion was uh, exerted. There was video, mild video effects in almost all of the videos, but very few were like special vis uh, visual effects. This is in Star Wars. Um, and they had uh, music without any words played in almost 70% of the videos. Now this was the 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 main I think the main you know novelty of our our paper. We coded what we did was we actually transcribed all of the the words and then we um, analyzed the 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 words uh, which is called content analysis um, through a qualitative method of collecting themes and the themes that we found were all of the ones over here and there's the frequency. The ones I wanted to point out to you was so patients have always said, you know, doctors don't give me any hope. I have an injury. I can't fix it. They said, you know, they left me here to die. But these clinics gave me that hope. So 26% said that the clinics gave me hope to their viewer, which would be potentially another patient. Over half of them praised the stem cell provider or the treatment. And uh, almost a third of them recommended to, again, the viewer to go and get a stem cell treatment. Now this is a powerful patient narrative, okay? Um, just to unpack praise, these were some of the words that they used, okay? So these are, these are the data that I would actually put in the paper in the results section. Um, even quotes uh, in qualitative research. So, you know, I thank you, I love you because you're my extended family for making me well again, thanks. You know, and, and, and other short phrases. 
Okay, so we concluded that these were pretty powerful types of things, uh, powerful ways of, of convincing people to take a stem cell treatment. Uh, this research is obviously important if we're going to develop any type of countermeasures uh, that maybe instead of giving patients a warning with a patient booklet or a doctor wagging their you know, finger, maybe we need to use more sophisticated and theoretically based countermeasures, uh, education, for example, to counter these very you know, powerful types of messages. So this is an example of bioethics research, and this got published in 2019 in Stem Cell Reports. So take-home messages. Um, really, I think the one take-home is you should try to complement your biomedical background with something if you want to get into public policy. Uh, and there are many careers you can, uh, you know, there are many careers out there, and there's probably several ways to get them. There is no single way. And try what is you think is going to work best for you and your circumstances. And that's it. Questions? All must have some questions. Um, can you hear me? OK, perfect. Yes. My uh, computer might cut out during this, so I had to grab some headphones. Okay. Um, but there is a question in the chat um, from Nick oh. Chinetti, and he asked if, um, is there a way to get experience in policy um, without or before pursuing a master's? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think you could do some kind of internship or something. The internship was good for me because it, it gave me a, a little bit of an understanding of what that world might be like. But honestly, it's really hard to get an understanding of a job until you kind of get into the job. Um, but you can do that. If there is also something at your university um, uh, or, or an organization, so, you know, Mayo is kind of interesting because um, our PhDs are actually not paid from grants. They're actually paid by um, our department. Uh, the, sorry, the different departments um, that they work in. So a lot of them basically take internships. And because we're so close to, you know, St. Paul, uh, which is the capital of Minnesota, um, uh, a lot of them do internships and stuff. If you can try to do that, maybe while you're a graduate student or maybe as a postdoc, some of these are unpaid. So at least, you know, you're able to eat and sleep still because you're getting a, a stipend uh, as a PhD student or, or getting some money as a um, postdoc. That might be a good way of at least getting your feet wet. Um, and I think that would be a, a great way. So I would say try to use the sources that are available to you um, there may be um, summer programs and things. I literally took a sabbatical, uh, if you, if you want to call it that, from my graduate work. I went to my graduate committee and I said, listen, I want to make this transition. They were all supportive of it. I said, you know, I got to write a bunch of papers. This was obviously closer to the end of my PhD. I'm going to write my papers, write my thesis, uh, and I'm going to work full time. Is that okay? And they let me go. Yeah. Um, so there was another question from Lucy, um, mm -hmm. who asks, what is required for work in hospitals? Um, in, in what sense, though, Lucy? What are you talking about? Um, what do you mean work? Like a policy position in a hospital? If so, um, a master's of health administration. Health administration is primarily if you want to be a hospital administrator. Um, and that could mean anything. That could mean looking at budgets for ordering things. That could mean uh, any type of administration. So um, um, I don't know, uh, HR, anything like that, but in the context of healthcare. Uh, so you would, uh, that's a, a very specific Masters of Health Administration, a very specific program, primarily to kind of get you in those types of organizations. It's not transferable into like, if you will, if you want to work in a government group and do policy, it, it may not be that easily transferable. So that is one way to, to get in, um, in a hospital. You can try to get a job. Um, again, it might be a little difficult um, if you're coming straight out of grad school or something like that. But uh, a master's of public, uh, health administration might be a good way of getting into a, a hospital admin type position. Yeah, and so... And, um, and when I say admin, I don't mean like an assistant for some scientist or something. I mean, uh, you know, the senior level types of administrative positions where you're running all different types of committees. Like, for example, we have a committee that looks at, um, you know, how we're going to um, um, distribute the vaccine. You may be in charge of that, for example. Yeah, and so um, 
I guess to kind of add on to that or maybe clarify that question, uh, Rob added, do you need additional education to work in a hospital in terms of policy and ethics? Like, is it a requirement or? Um, I don't think it would necessarily be a requirement. It would depend on how they advertise and what the specific job was for. You, you know, their essential qualifications may be general. You have to have a master's or a graduate level PhD in any kind of science, but they may ask for what they call an asset qualification, something that is more specific. So then they may say, I, you know, graduate degree or five years experience in this area. And that will probably disqualify you because there'll be one person that has that, they'll probably might get that position. Right. Um, so Britta also asked a question, um, which is going to be a little bit specific to you, but I think it's uh, interesting for people to hear about. Um, and mm -hmm. it's what is a typical day or week like for you and what you're currently doing? Pretty much the same as what your supervisors uh, and your faculty are doing. Uh, I predominantly, I'd say like 20%, maybe not even, uh, I spend on some kind of committees. I probably do about, I don't know, I teach three very light courses per year, two of which are just offered, is the same course offered twice. Um, and our courses are like 10, 12 weeks, so they're not super long. Uh, and most of my time I'm doing some type of research. Um, so I'm analyzing something, I'm writing papers, uh, I'm uh, applying for grants, um, I'm um, writing pro progress reports, uh, supervising students, uh, things like that. And so uh, unless another question pops up in the chat box, I will ask the question that I like to ask all speakers that come to us. Um, and that's if people that attend this meeting or people that watch the recording afterwards um, have specific questions and want to reach out to you, um, is it okay if they connect with you on LinkedIn or do you prefer via email? Email would be the best way, please. And okay, yeah, I would be more than happy to talk to you sort of afterwards. Um, you can email me, we can set a time to chat or Zoom or whatever, or just exchange emails back and forth. Uh, but that would be the best way, I think. Okay, perfect. And I'm just gonna put your email in the chat box if that's okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I should have showed, I should have showed the last slide because the last slide is my email. <laughs> no worries, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I can, I can just type it in if you would like. I got it. There you go. Yep. Yeah, so feel free to email me. Um, I'd be more than happy to chat more. Are there other questions? I see to help moderate that, do you need a, oh, right, okay. Uh, are there other questions that you had about bioethics or you know, science policy? Does anybody have a specific question about a place they might wanna work at in the future? I may be able to shed light, I may not. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question is, um, do you, how often do you interact with people with um, maybe like not so much a biomedical science background and like more like a law background? Or do you find people that have both um, more so master's my, degrees? Like what's the breakdown of like people that you come into contact with? Most people are actually are not like me. I only know a, a handful and I literally mean a handful of bioethics scholars that actually have a PhD in molecular and cellular biology or anything biochem, anything like that. Uh, most of them are actually, I'd say philosophers, physicians, lawyers, sociologists. So the head of my department is, sorry, the head of my group is a philosopher. Um, we have, uh, actually we have another philosopher. We have a clinician we have a sociologist, I'm the only scientist, and we're actually thinking about getting a lawyer. And do they, um, I guess, I know like that's what you're doing currently, but along the way, did you find a similar like variety of people that you were interacting with or were you still like one of the only scientists and like everyone else oh, was there? Um, it depends on the group, right? So, you know, when I sit on the public policy committee of ISSCR, well, they're mostly scientists <laughs> and there's a few clinicians um, and there is um, maybe about three of us that, um, well, actually maybe about two or three of them, um, um, not counting those, you know, Greenwall fellow people, but uh, there's about two or three of them that are, have like a bioethics or law background. Um, so there's fewer of us usually I would say in bioethics in general, there's a lot fewer science 
uh, PhD going into making that transition. Most of them, I would say, again, come from law, the human, their, their humanities. It's again, a traditionally a humanist um, background and a lot of clinicians actually, because clinicians have always dealt with ethical issues at the bedside. So a lot of them get uh, uh, additional degrees in medical humanities um, and, you know, but are an MD by, by training. So we, we would be a rarer breed for sure. Uh, so another question popped up asking, what is the career prospect for a person in policymaking? In terms of like getting, so I think your career prospect, so you know, getting faculty positions are not easy, right? Postdocs are getting super long, you know, I've had a couple of people that I've, you know, kept in contact with ever since like, you know, undergrad or even graduate school, only a few of them have ended up with a, a, a lab position. And, you know, these people are almost getting like a nature paper in their postdoc or something, you know, super, super amazing. Or they're, and they're obviously they're doing, they're trying to bring some kind of new, let's say animal model system or, or uh, you know, uh, something unique to a group that wants to expand and diversify. So they're, they're looking for something and they just happen to be at the right place, at the right time kind of thing. Um, it's just getting more difficult. I don't think that these are um, as problematic in the policy world. Policy is so diverse, and uh, so there are many different areas you can you can go into. Um, like I said, you can work for a funding agency, you can work for the EPA. If you only want your specific little niche and and are only focused in health and only want to work for one particular area, well, yes, then it's going to be you know a lot less. But I think you know. There's a whole world out there uh, for policy uh, in science. And uh, honestly, with the way things are going, I think it's probably a good thing to have more scientists in science policy. Yeah, for sure. Um, so another question, uh, mm -hmm. what are typical job titles for someone just getting started in the field? Uh, junior policy analyst, uh, policy analyst, um, you know, um, you can, there, there can be all kinds of different, it depends on the, so, you know, like, I don't know what it takes, for example, to be a program officer at NIH, right? All of those people I know have a PhD. I don't talk to anybody that doesn't have a PhD. I believe some of, I think, believe many of them nowadays have probably even done a postdoc prior to uh, getting in there. But their world is very much also focused on funding, right? They're only doing funding. Maybe they'll sit on a couple of policy committees because NIH also makes policies uh, outside of just funding policies. Uh, but um, um, you know, it, it depends on what government or what agency you're working for. But yeah, policy analyst, I was called, you know, regulatory analyst. Regulatory affairs is a little bit different. They're uh, people overseeing uh, how products may become de uh, developed and go into the regulatory pipeline through the FDA. They usually work in companies or even in, in academic uh, centers, things like that. So it, it, there's a wide range of, of, I would look at the description, not as much as, of the title. And so um, I'll ask another question and it's, what was the biggest like hurdle for you personally in making that switch? Um, Cause I know you said you had wanted to do it for a long time and it just, you know, you had to go through school. Yeah. And yeah. So for me, um, in bioethics, the biggest hurdle was that I didn't understand what bioethicists did when I did my postdoc. They value a lot of different things that I didn't value as a, a scientist. For example, they value writing. <laughs> you know, I was always a horrid writer. Um, uh, I'm a, I love writing now, I can tell you that, but it's, you know, however dozens of years later. Uh, but um, I had a hard time writing. I, I had a hard time conveying my thoughts and making arguments in paper, on paper. And um, um, there was also a culture shift. You know, when I was in, uh, when I was working as a postdoc, I didn't publish with, you know, they value single author papers. So they wanted me to publish all on my own. They didn't publish with me, whereas your PI is going to be on everything you pretty much do. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's just a different culture. And so the culture, getting understanding how they worked, uh, and it was my duty to understand how they work, not the other way around, was really challenging for me. But now I can speak, eat, breathe their language very easily. Um, in fact, I would probably, you know, I recognize some of the genes in some of these ISSER talks, but I can't remember a pathway. I cannot tell you, um, 
you know, the specific amino acid sequence of, you know, uh, phosphatyrosines binding to SH2 domains. I cannot remember that. I have to relook at my thesis or something like that. So all of that details is gone. So I can, but I can still communicate. I still understand the culture of labs. I still understand what scientists go through. Uh, and same with, with their world uh, in the humanities. I can, you know, communicate with them. So it's kind of cool, but it was a bit of a learning curve for sure. I know we talked about, about, about uh, a bit about this before the meeting, um, but as far as um, pre-COVID, uh, what was it like for you as far as, you know, travel? Like how much travel was involved mm. in the work that you do and meetings and uh, conferences? Yeah, so Mayo gives you a nice healthy budget for that. So that was always good. They want you, you know, they, they support you trying to get an international. For me to become a full professor, um, I would have to uh, get what they call international recognition, which is an amorphous term. I don't know really what that means at the end of the day. Uh, but certainly, you know, going to only one meeting a year would, would not suffice. Um, we also, the, you know, it's, you know, they call it the, the, you know, the Matthew effect, right? The, the more, the more you do, the easier it is to get the rewards of science, right? And so, um, you know, the more senior you are, uh, you get invitations for a lot of these things. So for me, my travel was minimum once a month, if not, I'd say probably at least bi-weekly. Uh, and I tried to lower that. I don't like traveling all the time. I found it unproductive, uh, but it depends. Some people travel all the time. Um, some people travel a little bit less. Uh, for me, I'd say probably about, yeah, I don't know, 15, 20% maybe. It's hard for me to calculate. But yeah, I'd be going to at least several conferences a year, uh, smaller meetings, a lot more um, committees. Also, um, we're doing things where you just have, you know, it was so weird, just doing things face to face was a, a very prominent thing in, in academia. I think that's all going to change now, though, because um, it's a lot more expensive to shove people around in a plane and pay for hotels. So um, I think that is probably going to change. But yeah, there was, um, there was a, a, you know, fair bit of travel. My Delta points went up, you know. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like there's a couple of people signing off since we are at four o'clock. Okay. Um, so if there's any other one, anyone else that has questions, um, we have the email that was put in the chat. Feel free Perfect. to reach out. Um, and a big thank you uh, for coming to talk to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to stay in touch. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.